And Shea's thesis in this book, as you know, is that when a leader destroys the legitimacy of the army's moral order by betraying what he calls themis, what's right, the order of things, the structure by which we can understand the world as predictable and well-ordered, in so doing, injuries are inflicted on the soldiers that are not physical injuries. They are what Shea calls moral injuries. And these moral injuries arise, he suggests, both in the Iliad, where Homer describes the immediate and devastating consequences on Achilles, first of the feeling of injustice at having had his war prize taken away from him, and then through what uh, Shea calls the berserk behavior that results as the consequence of the death of his friend Patroclus. Now, let me pause and say that in talking about this, we're glossing over many, many things that are problematic about that story. What is it that Achilles is upset about? He's upset about the woman who was given to him as a prize for battle being taken away from him and given to another man. I take it that, for most of you, your conception of what the moral order permits does not include war prizes of that form. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the ethics section. How do we make sense of moral standards that are treated as legitimate in one domain and not in the other? But for the time being, I would like you to bracket here, as we bracketed in the context of most of the ancient texts that we've been reading, that which you find unfamiliar, and focus instead on what you find familiar. The description of Achilles' experience is one that rings true, and it rings true in the same way that the description of the Vietnam soldiers' experience rings true. Shea points out that just as the Iliad is a story of these devastating consequences for Achilles and the other soldiers, so too are the narratives that the Vietnam soldiers provide an instance of something that forces us to see that the consequences go beyond, and here's a quote from the Iliad, the war's loss upon bitter loss leaving so many dead men, that the consequence is to taint the lives of those who survive it. One of the greatest harms that the Vietnam War appears to have done to a good portion of those who served there, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, is to have produced in them a set of symptoms that some psychiatrists find helpful to describe as post-traumatic stress disorder. And these are symptoms that affect the soldiers the survivors of trauma, in three domains. They affect their actions in the world, they affect their perceptions of the world, and they affect their social experiences. So one of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder is a persistent mobilization of the body and mind for lethal danger, a potential for explosive violence as the result of being constantly on alert. All of you know the experience of being in full focus when you feel yourself to be in danger. It's something that occupies a huge percentage of the body's resources. Everything goes on focusing on being hair trigger responsive. And you can have this in all sorts of domains. You can have it if you're engaged in a video game which requires you to do an incredibly quick response, or if you feel yourself in some kind of threat situation. But it's an in full body experience of being related to the world in a particular way. Now imagine being on alert in that way all the time. One consequence of being on alert in that way is that one perceives things in the most negative light possible. If you are what's sometimes called risk averse, then you are going to, for each encounter you have, 
entertain the possibility that what you confront is the worst case scenario. And soldiers who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder perceive those things around them through the heightened attentional mechanisms that come with this hair trigger action and view them as potential dangers. And the things that they pursue as potential dangers are not merely mundane objects in the world, like an object lying on a table that might ambiguously be either a gun or an innocent piece of cardboard, but also in their social interactions. And perhaps the greatest cost, and we'll see why this is such a cost in Thursday afternoon's lecture, perhaps the greatest cost is the loss of the possibility of social trust. And I want to point out to you the way in which this can happen to cultures as a whole. Communities that find themselves subject to certain kinds of terrorist or guerrilla warfare by those who are opposed to them lose the capacity to behave humanely towards those with whom they struggle. If your opponent's strategy is to bring bombs into your country using ambulances, then you will be forced to treat ambulances as suspicious objects. If, as Shay describes in Achilles in Vietnam, a common strategy is to put a baby atop a pile of explosives, then you will be forced through your enemy's actions not to help a needing child. Robbing your enemy of the capacity to behave humanely to you is a strategy that produces a cycle of incredible disorder. Because, of course, it's only a feeling of being cornered with nothing else to do that would lead somebody to take the strategy of using ambulances to carry bombs and so on. The orderliness that governs conventional warfare is a reflection of a certain kind of psychological need. And the disorderliness that is typical of non-conventional warfare of which Vietnam is an example and terrorism is a second, is something that produces in societies as a whole some kind of approximation of the post-traumatic stress disorder that Shea identifies in the soldiers.